go ahead and start reading uh, Revelation 16. Revelation 16 is when the vials are actually poured out. And uh, so we're going to go ahead and read, and then we'll do like a quick review, and then we'll get into the Word. Amen. It says, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast. You know, I kind of looked that word noisome up because, and I could be wrong, but what I remember learning in school, even like when I was in nursing school, I'm pretty sure that word in the English vocabulary means like it has a smell to it. But the word in the Greek is kakos, and this whole idea is that it's an evil sore. It's, it's an evil sore. Okay. Upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was. It shall be, because you have judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which has power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since the men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell, and Great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. You know... There's a, at this point, when you read this whole chapter, what you begin to see is, the, you know, well, not begin to see, the whole chapter is about the wrath of God being poured out. I don't know if you've spent up much time talking to people. I'm sure by now many of you have spent some time. I can look in the crowd and I can see that the majority of y'all have probably spent some time witnessing to other people. And if you've spent any length of time talking to other people, you may have run across somebody already. If you haven't yet, you probably will. But it's just not really a believer, and they'll begin to question how you can serve a God that, you know, brings disaster on people or brings pain, and why would he cause such, you know, 
trouble in people's lives. I mean, they also attribute to God a lot of things that really are God's fault. In other words, a lot of things man has brought upon himself. But one of the things that I just want to share with you, and I want to let you know that this is the end. This book that we're reading, when it says the, revela the, the revelation of Jesus Christ, it's the time whenever the world is no longer going to be questioning whether he's real. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I don't know I've said that before, but you as believers that have been living for the Lord and even living for the Lord out loud or physically where people can see you out in the open, meaning you carry Jesus with you in the life that you live. And sometimes people might make fun of you or they don't understand you or they might even talk behind your back. But there's coming a day because, see, people can't see Jesus right now in the physical. And, and really, truly, like Paul said, that you and I are the our epistles, we're letters. We're living letters that, that are supposed to share the gospel through our lives, through our actions, through our words, where other people can see the truth of Jesus. But there's coming a day whenever you're going to be vindicated. I will be vindicated. All those witnesses that have gone before us will be vindicated because, because there's coming a day when there's not no longer going to be a question. The Bible says... That every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. What we're seeing here is the end. It's not like God hasn't been patient, right? I want you to understand that. Like, the Bible teaches us that God is long-suffering. And I, and I want to share because one of the fruit of the spirits is long-suffering. And the interesting, you know, and it says in 2 Peter that, that God is long-suffering toward us. In that he waits a little bit longer is what it, because he's waiting for for man to come to repentance. That's the good. That's the goodness of God right there. The goodness of God is that he's long suffering and he doesn't allow this day to come until it's time. There's coming a time when this is going to be God's going to say enough and this day is going to come and the wrath of God is going to be poured out on unrepentant man. Okay, but until that day God is long suffering. And he's been long suffering through the years. And the day uh, we have been living in the day of grace where God is gracious and he's merciful and his good news and his gospel goes forth. And he allows people to hear the good news so that they might repent and that their heart might be given to God. But then again, there's coming a day whenever that time frame is going to stop and it's going to go from being grace to being the wrath. Because one of the things that you got to be reminded of, it's important that we understand this, and I believe that whenever we do, by the way, uh, Danielle, I need you to put a sign-up sheet back there for people that may be interested in getting that book that we're going to have that class about the supernatural realm and things like that. I think that if we go through this book together, and it's not the scripture really is what it is. Um, when we go through this together from the angle that we're going to be looking at, it's going to be real clear on why this is so, this situation is so severe and so significant. And we got to understand that when we read the whole of the Bible, that, that there is an ancient rebellion that has been going on, that's been in existence since before you and I were ever, since before Adam was ever created. You see, and God is making that right. Now, most, I'm not picking, I'm not fussing. Most Christians don't even have a clue about any of that. Because most Christianity today, and again, not picking on anybody, just telling you the truth. Most Christianity today, the whole message focuses on how, when you come into this place, how I can say some words to make you, to make the word of God relevant to your life right here, right now. And it's important that you understand that the Word of God is relevant to your life right here, right now. The instruction of God will give you wisdom and understanding so that you can navigate the journey and you can live for God. And you can also understand that everything's not going to always go your way, right? But that at the same time, God will minister to you. He will strengthen you. He will encourage you. and he will. But the Word of God will teach you and I that it's not all about us. It's kind of like what that psalm was saying. I'm sorry, Lord, for the way things I've made. It's, it's all about you, Lord. Really, this whole thing is all about you. Amen? But most of the church is not in a place where they're really thinking that it's all about you. We sing the song, but that's not really the way that the message comes forth. That it's all about you, Lord. Because if we really understood what the Word of God is saying, we would understand that that this ancient rebellion has been against God and that this, this lying serpent has injected his poison into the human race and that the majority of the human race is also in rebellion. 
rebellion against God and they're attempting to pull God's creation away from him. And God waits another day. He waits another week, another month, another year before he, because he's long suffering and he's waiting for another to repent. And the way that people come to repentance is that someone like you, someone like Gowdy, oh hallelujah, someone like Gerald, takes that truth of the gospel that has been placed on the inside of them and brings them outside of the walls of this church, wherever the Lord would bring you, and, and God will open up a door and you're able to minister the truth of the gospel and plant a seed of glory on the inside of somebody's life. They might fall on their knees right then and there. I don't know. <laughs> They may not know. But it's a seed of the gospel that has been planted. Guess what? It's not my responsibility. I used to carry this burden around my back. Like, I'm like, Lord, I, I, I've been talking to all these people about Jesus, and, no, and, and, and nobody's gotten saved at this particular place. And you know, the, you know, the Lord told me, He said, Son, you, you're worried about things that ain't really for you to be worried about. I've called you to sow seed. I'm going to bring somebody in behind you, and they're going to water it. And guess what? I'm the Lord of the harvest. God said, I'm the Lord of the harvest. It's not for you to go around getting everybody saved. Just do what I've called you to do. So God is long-suffering in this time frame that we know of grace. Where the gospel is going forward and people are having the opportunity to receive. But there's coming a day when that time frame is going to stop. And the wrath of God is going to be poured out. And I don't know about you, but listen, we all need to get this way. We, and you know how we get this way is when we spend time in prayer. I'm telling you, Amen. we need more corporate prayer. We need more individual prayer. And when we're praying, we don't need it to be, and I'm saying this facetiously, but you'll get the point. We don't need it to be, my name is Jimmy, what you're going to give me, okay? In other words, it doesn't need to be all about us. It needs to be about God and his plan. And listen, he said this, listen, you can hold God to this. He said, is seek me first in my righteousness. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. God wants to meet your needs. He wants to meet my needs. He wants to do above and, and beyond that. Even in this earth, he wants to bless you. He wants to promote you. He wants to give you raises. I'm telling you. He wants to put money in your bank account. He wants to give you a nicer house, a nicer car, if it's all in his will, is what I'm trying to say. But what he really wants you to do is, he wants you to seek him first and his righteousness. And he wants you to be of a willing heart that says, even if you don't give it to me, Lord, what I want to do is I want to serve you. I want to live for you and I want to be used by you. See? With a heart like that, he can work with that, my friend. He knows whenever he can give us stuff, if that's even in his will for our life. Some people are like, man, I know it's God's will. Well, okay, whatever. <laughs> I'm just saying if we get so focused on material possessions, we're going right. to miss the whole point. But what I meant to say was this, is that if we will spend time in prayer, if we will get along with the Lord, then we will begin to pray his heart. And what I get from the overall word of God is that his heart hurts for the law. <laughs> You know how much God the Father's heart hurts for the law? He sent his very heart down here. <laughs> Listen to me. This is not just some fairy tale, my friend. This is not just some little story. Peter talked about it. John talked about it. It didn't happen in some back alley. No, no, no. Peter said we were with him. Peter said that Peter wants you and I to know we were with him on that mountain. We saw the glory that was in him shine out of him. We saw the glory come out of our Lord. We saw him transfigured before us. This thing didn't happen in the back alley. We're here to tell you that this was true. The very one that God sent, God himself in human flesh, was here. Amen. And if you and I will line up with that and we'll begin to share and believe that, when God gives us those opportunities, we will be pleasing the Lord. And as we pray, and we pray that way, and we say, Lord, make me make my heart beat for what your heart beats. Yes. Lord, make my heart desire to see souls one into the kingdom. Amen? Yes. And listen, it doesn't happen overnight, church. But as we get along with the Lord, and we begin to pray that way, I'm telling you right now, God will begin to do a work. Amen? And you will see, even if revival, I don't know what revival is supposed to look like. I mean, I can tell you that people's hearts are changed in revival. Yes. How, you know what would be nice is if we had individual revivals. <laughs> if we brought those individual revivals. Amen. Lord, revive my heart. Amen. Yes, Lord. My whole point in going down this thread was just to say that one day it's going to stop. 
and this is what's going to happen. Right. All right. So going to this, <coughs> talking about Revelation 16, the emphasis like you just we just read was about the vile judgments. And I asked the question. I've already I've already brought this concept to you before. We've actually done this way back several chapters ago, but since then I've done some other teaching and I've, I've allowed, I've, I say I've allowed, I've introduced more information to some of you to maybe like stimulate some thinking. And so now we're going to kind of go backwards to go forward and we're going to repeat some information because when it's all said and done, what I want you to really know is, is that it was never, it's never my intent, especially with a subject like the book of Revelation, to get you to think what I think. In the end, you think with whatever you think the Word of God says. But what I am trying to do is I'm trying to give you fuel and understanding for things that I'm seeing so that you yourself will go to the Scriptures and you yourself will dig and dissect and you yourself will go to the Lord and say, Lord, please show me. Because guess what? It's important. It's important, especially in the days that we live in. I believe in that. So the main question is, in Revelation 16, when we look at the vile judgments, do they coincide with the trumpets? And I'm going to try to bring back some of these uh, verses, okay? So let me just go ahead and read to you, and you might be able to read from back there. You may not be able to, but in Revelation 16, 2, it talks about, well, let's go ahead and go to this first one. So look, the first angel sounded, and there followed Hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burned up, and all green grass was burned up. All right. Before we read this next verse right here, what I want to say is, is that if you'll remember whenever I, I, I kind of like reminded you of this idea about three weeks ago, I said, I said that because sometimes people don't think of the trumpets and the vials happening together, right? I mean, if anybody in here, I mean, how many people in here have actually studied the book of Revelation yourself? Okay, go ahead, raise, yep. raise your hand. I know some. Okay, how many people have read the book of Revelation? <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right, so we got about six or seven people that have read, eight people maybe that have read the book of Revelation. All right, if you haven't read it yet, that's okay. I mean, you, when, when it, but there's a blessing in it. The Bible says that there's a blessing specifically connected to that book when you read it. Okay, so some of you, many of you have read the book. Maybe three or four of y'all have studied the book. I'm telling you right now, a lot of people don't study it. My brother-in-law Aaron wouldn't mind me sharing this with you. I mean, he's studying the book of Revelation. Like, I'm like, dude, you need to slow down. He's like, nope, I got to gotta catch up, bro. And, and I mean, he's like devouring it. But he'd be honest with you and tell you for probably how many years you think you did, you did, you stayed away from it. Most of my Christian life. Most of his Christian life. How long have you been saved that you know? I was raised in it. Raised in it. But, I mean, and, and the serving the Lord, he served the Lord as a teenager. Okay. And I would say, hey, you look up the book. Oh, no, 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 that's not, well, I don't mess with that. You know, and it's because, and, he, and to be honest, there's a lot of reasons why. And part of it was, was that whenever he would study it from a pre-tribulational standpoint and demand that that be the standpoint, it would cause confusion. And so he was like, he felt, and he told me that, he's like, I'm discombobulated, you know, and so he put it to the side. Okay, but now that is, okay, so, the, but the point that I, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that if you've studied the book of Revelation and you followed after a certain way of thinking, then the idea of the trumpets and the vials coinciding has not really been a, a big viewpoint. Okay, it's usually the seals, and then and then and so usually a pre-tribulational standpoint is the rapture, and then the first seal through seal number seven opens up, and when seal number seven opens up, the first trumpet blows, and then it goes through the seven trumpets. And then the last trumpet blows and the vials are poured out. Okay, so the wrath of God is split into two. And so what I'm trying to say is if you've never read it, then you don't have, you know, any context to draw from. But if, but if you have read it, then it's probably different in your mind to hear me say it that way. Okay, so either way, what you need to understand is that a lot of people teach that... The trumpets blow one through seven, and then the vials are opened one through seven. But what I'm trying to say is I'm giving you a different viewpoint to, to, to consider, to pray about, to, to see. Is it possible that you got a trumpet being blown, 
and this is what I'm seeing. The trumpet is blown, boop, boop, and a viol is poured. Trumpet number two, boop, boop, and viol number two is poured. Trumpet number three, boop, boop, and you get it. My, my voice is getting left. I'm getting gravity. And viol number three is poured. So you get the point. All right. So in it says right here now in this particular comparison between the trumpets and the vials, trumpet one, vial one. I will admit to you that there's not a direct, obvious connection between these two right here. So let's go ahead and read it. The first angel sounded, there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. They were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burned up, and all green grass was burned up. <coughs> and then the first angel, the storm of the vials, so the first angel with a vial, the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Now, I just, want to, I just want to make a couple of comments. I can't prove this either way, but it doesn't seem that difficult for me to believe that if there's some kind of a spiritual, supernatural hail that's falling with blood, and men are on the earth... Okay, during this time frame that maybe even some of this stuff hitting them could also cause some grievous sores. Does that make sense? Okay, again, I, I mean, it's just there. You call it speculation, call it whatever you want to call it, but it's not that difficult for me to imagine that in my mind, okay? So that was trumpet number one, vial number one, and here's trumpet number uh, two and vial number two. Let's go ahead and take a look at them together. And then the second angel sounded, and as it were, great mountain with burning fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood now look and the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea now we can definitely see the correlation between these two it's almost like it makes perfect sense now whenever we look at it like this and one of the things that i thought was good i think aaron might have told danielle because she shared with me one time she's like well the way aaron said it really made sense. It's almost like God is signaling with the trumpet boop, boop. The, the angel blows the angel pours. The angel blows, the angel pours. Here's the signal or the cause and the effect. Okay? Alright, so you can see the connection with sea and blood. I mean, it's obvious that there's there seems to be a connection there. Alright, so now we're talking about the third. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of the water. Seal number, I mean, vial number three. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. Now look at this. I mean, look, this is eight chapters later. Okay. Look at the, the choice of words. Okay, we do believe that the Bible is called plenary inspiration, meaning word for word. We, now listen, I don't really want to get into this technicality, but I, but I do want to make a point. Have you ever, okay, I took a class on Tom on how to write, and I love this concept. The, the, the teacher was saying, listen, for every time you're trying to find a word, there's a perfect word to put in that sentence to describe what you're trying to describe. Does that make sense? He says, but there's a whole catalog of words that you could use. I mean, I, don't, I can't sit here and rattle off a bunch of synonyms and shoot from my hip and do that. I just can't do it. I mean, I wish I could. But you can imagine 10 words that all have very similar meaning, and you could pick any one of those words and implant it into that sentence, and it would still have meaning. But there is one particular word within that list of words that is perfect. All right? What I'm trying to tell you is my understanding of plenary inspiration is that God took these men. Now listen, the Apostle Paul was an intellect in the Jewish religion, and Peter was a fisherman. So they, and that's, a, okay, it's a big difference than like the way that demon spirits do. I'm not trying to get weird on you, but okay, let me just give you an example. I don't even know why I'm getting into this, but let me just, it's called automatic writing. All right, Ozzy Osbourne said in Black Sabbath, their first three albums were not even written by them. I'm just telling you, like something took over them and they just, Started doing this number here. Jimmy Page bought Aleister Crowley's house and they wrote Stairway to Heaven. In that house is still the number one selling song of all time. 
They said straight up automatic writing. Something would come over them, words that they did not know would just begin to flow through the pen onto the paper. It was words that they didn't even know. As crazy as that sounds, I don't have time to really get into all of this, but I did open the can of worms, so I'm going to tell you. I bought a 10-hour documentary one time. I was so into this stuff. It was supported by Kirk Cameron. It was called They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll. I used to laugh at that concept. The guy's name is Pastor Joe Schimmel. You can look up some of his videos right now called Good Fight Ministries. He will have videos that will blow your mind. How does he even get these videos? I have no clue, okay? He's got video and audio, and I'm talking about it's the people, dude. His videos of Elvis getting into a, a, a Rolls Royce, okay? This is just an example of how far back this stuff goes. Elvis getting into a Rolls Royce, and they're saying, what you been doing, Elvis? And he's like talking about a sexual escapade that he just had with some girl. And the guy's like, points to the camera that's in the Rolls Royce that's looking at him. He looks up, he sees the camera, and he said, and he, he he changes his face and he says, "What a friend we have in Jesus." So you know, and I mean, there it is. It's documented on the video. They got audio of Jerry Lee Lewis screaming in Sun Records, saying, "We're gonna go to hell! Do you hear what I'm telling you? We're going straight to hell!" And you can tell it's him. It's his voice. So, so what is, what is your point? He just got saved. Amen. Praise God. Yeah, praise, praise God. God. And I mean, look, if, you're gonna, if you would listen to this audio, I knew what I was listening to. This brother right here is not okay with whatever he just experienced. They don't, you don't hear in the tape what they told him to make him react like that. All you know is that this dude is disturbed. You hear me? And so praise God for that. Amen. Well, so anyway, what is my point? My point is, is that Joe Schimmel. This guy that made this video. This is how he got saved. You know, I remember how I tell you I love everybody's testimony. I love this dude's testimony. So he said, he tell you, he says, listen, I had no dog in the hunt, dude. I was an atheist. I wasn't no devil worshiper. I just wanted to be a rock and roll guitar player. I wanted to make it big. And he's like, I'm pl playing gigs. I'm with these bands. I'm practicing my skill. He said, I started being awakened in the middle of the night with a flow of words in my mind. I had, I started keeping a notebook by the side of my bed. And I started scribbling these words down. He said, but after about four or five nights of this, I started looking at the words. And I'm like, dude, I don't even know what these words are. He started having to look them up in, di in the dictionary because he had never even heard of the word. Things like rest, which is a shortened version of wrestle, and tress, which is another word for crown. And I mean, he'll sit here and spit these lyrics at you, and it's like, whoa, dude, like, that is crazy. He's like, I didn't know none of these words. And so then he said, I started trying to research, like, what is this? What happens whenever a person has word, and he comes across automatic writing, and he learns how this automatic writing thing is interconnected to the occult, and that the concept is that demon spirits are using human beings as vessels to hold the pen so that they can put down what they want to be put down. That's the demonic version. What I'm trying to tell you is that when the Holy Spirit inspired the Word of God, He used the man himself and the vocabulary that was contained in him. But God knew exactly which word. It, listen, Apostle Paul knew words that Peter might not have known. So what the Lord did was He went through the database that was in them and boom, He inspiring the word and they're, they're writing the words of their amanuensis is writing the words which is a Greek word for secretary is writing the words down as the Lord is inspiring it what, what was my point to that my point to that was this look at the word choice do you think it's accidental that eight chapters later the third trumpet the third vial rivers and upon the fountains of waters <coughs> rivers and fountains of waters they became one so what I'm trying to tell you is, is that I believe that the Lord, if you believe like I believe in the inspiration of Scripture, and you believe that God has chosen to reveal himself through human language, to reveal himself through human language, and that he went through it to protect the word of God so that you and I could see it, then you see the connection is what I'm trying to, the big point I'm trying to make. All right? There we go. This is the fourth. The fourth angel sound. And the, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, 
And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Now, I'll, I'm going to be honest with you because I'm always going to be honest. Because, look, y'all some smart people. So I ain't trying to trick. When you look at the side on the left, it's saying that it was smitten and that it became dark. And when you look at the side on the right, it's saying that it's almost like the sun got more power and started scorching people, right? And so the two seem to be, I'm just going to use a fancy word, I think it works, a dichotomy. Uh, uh, like they seem to contradict, okay? And so what I'm trying to tell you is, on the surface, yeah, but what about solar flares? What about the angel pours his vial upon the sun and solar flares start burning people and then it exudes so much power that the next thing you know it's smitten and it becomes dark for a portion of the day. You see what I'm trying to say? All I'm trying to say is there's a connection with the fourth trumpet and the fourth line. It has to do with the sun. Alright? Here is the fifth. It says that he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now, do you remember whenever we learned this a long time ago, we went over this, um, what was in the pit? Do y'all remember what makes the air dark? Something comes out of the pit. The locusts, you remember that? The locusts, and they had like faces of a man, and I think it was hair like a lion, and they had like scorpion stingers, and they were flying around, and the only people that they didn't sting was the 144,000 that were sealed with the seal of God, remember that? And that, that it said that they would sting these the people on the earth that weren't sealed and that this sting would last for six months and that, that it would be so much pain involved in that that men would want to die but that they couldn't, they couldn't die. Their life wouldn't leave them. God allowed them. Like, that's some bad wrath, my friend. <laughs> but just remember, God was merciful. And he gave people an opportunity. We'll close that out tonight with that. But look, the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. My point is, is this, is that in trumpet number uh, trumpet number five, right here, the, the, it, the pit is open, the, the, the locusts are released, the air becomes dark, uh, vial number five, Darkness is on is on the earth, and look at this, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. You see the you see the connection, the similarities, how these two could be so closely related. See, already you ought to be like, man, I'm telling you, like I can at least see how it seems like maybe these trumpets and these vials are working together. Alright? So here is um, here's trumpet number six and vial number six. Look, they're both connected to the river Euphrates. Saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And then in vial number six, the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now listen, you know, with these four Angels, they seem to be, whenever we went back and studied it, these four angels, they had been bound, is what the idea is, spiritually bound, okay? And they, and, they, and they were stuck in a specific place. I don't want to get, listen, I've heard a lot of things. Some things, I, I don't want to sit here and say, oh, no, that, that, that's not true, because how do I know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't have to answer to everything. But I have to be honest with you, sometimes there are certain things that people say, and I'm like, no, 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 I'm not really talking about that, you know? Uh, like, for instance, one person said that somebody was excavating near the river Euphrates. And I don't know, they found something down there and they heard, like, I don't know, sounds of chains, chain, chain going down there or something. Like, literally, that the angels were chained. I don't need it to be like that. In my mind, like, God's trying to tell us something. I don't have all the answers to what God's trying to tell us. There's a literal river called the Euphrates in Iraq, it's part of the area of Mesopotamia, it's part of the area where Abraham came from, it's modern day Iraq, okay, it's the land between the rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, but I'm trying to say I don't have to, it doesn't have to be, somehow though that they're bound and they're, because what they're going to do is whenever they're loose, they're, they seem to be bad angels, why would God have good angels locked up, right? So they seem to be bad angels and they're part of the wrath that's going to be poured out on the face of the earth. So the idea is, is that God's not allowing them to be loosed until this time and then once they are. And then part of it is, is look, 
it, it, this river Euphrates is going to be dried up and it's going to allow the armies from the east. And when we get to the end of this particular chapter, we're going to see that there's going to be demon spirits and deception that's going to cause the armies of the world to try to come against Israel. And really and truly, God's actually allowing the whole thing to happen and set them up because Jesus is going to come back for the battle of Armageddon and he's going to destroy them with the sword of his mouth. So during Revelation 16, 13 through 14, um, it talks about these three frogs. Now those are, I think my mama kind of likes frogs. Those are some cute looking frogs. I don't know why, you know, frogs got to be connected to demon spirits, but that's what the Bible said. We're going to go back and read it. It said if one frog came out of the dragon's mouth, that's the devil. That's that old serpent that turned into a dragon. Uh, one frog came out of the, the, the dragon's mouth, one frog came out of the, anti the beast's mouth, which is also the Antichrist, and one frog came out of the mouth of the false prophet, and that they are demon spirits, and that they're deceiving the nations, right? So I don't think that they're going to look cute like that. But I was trying to wonder, like earlier, why frog? I mean, what is the connection to this? And, and, I, and I'm not telling you that I had to figure it out, but I'm about to give you a possibility, okay? So one of the things that we see whenever we see the rivers turning into blood, when we see the ocean turning into blood, when we see hail falling, and really frogs, if you go back and you look at all of these things that are happening, you can correlate them to the plagues of Egypt. The only thing that you don't correlate is maybe, I don't think that they have lice in here, and, but I mean, but the water's turning into blood over and over again, it's the plagues of Egypt, and there's actually a frog plague. Now, when you go back and you study the plagues that Moses, that God, you know, allowed Moses and Aaron to speak upon the nation of Egypt, what scholars believe, well, what scholars have found is that each one of those plagues were kind of pointed at one of the Egyptian gods. So it's almost like God was bringing judgment on Egypt, but he was really bringing judgment on the gods that they served. And in the end, what he was doing was he was showing them that he was more powerful than those gods. See, that's another main concept of that book that I want to study, because listen, there's a whole bunch of gods, they're lower gods, that are out there that are trying to steal the glory from the God, amen, and right now it looks like sometimes they're getting away with some stuff, but they ain't getting away with nothing. God's about to bring all this stuff to a head, amen, and so maybe it has something to do with this. This is one of those Egyptian gods, Heket. She's like this little frog princess. <laughs> and so maybe it has something to do with that and interconnection with the plagues and the frogs and demon spirits and false gods and all this other kind of stuff. I can't prove it, but it's a good thought. All right, so he's going to, in this particular passage of scripture, I told you it was 16, I think 13 through 16, it says that these frogs, we'll go back and we'll read it in a second, just so that we can put our minds back on it, but it says that these frogs are going to lead the armies, they're going to lead the nations towards this place called Armageddon, it's, it's also known as Megiddo, you see this, this word Megiddo right there, I might be able to... To draw with my little pencil if it lets me. But you see this right here? Megiddo. It's in the valley of Jezreel. Now one interesting note, this is kind of like a side note from my family over here. I'm pretty sure, it's like I accidentally looked this up, right? I'm just telling you, like I was looking for a map that I could show the church. Megiddo. And I happened to find, this was the most clear map I could find. Now, I want you all to see this right here. Zion drill site. Y'all may not remember this, but your dad bought yeah. some stock in this. I might want to look into that. But anyway, it might be laying around somewhere. You don't know, dude. Two drill sites. Anyway, it's just, yeah. all right. Anyway, all right. So Megiddo, Armageddon. It's a valley of Jezreel, right? And it's a place in a valley. And they're going to be led there. These demon spirit frogs that are coming out of the dragon, coming out of the beast, coming out of the false prophet are going to be have lying wonders with them. And a great deception is going to take place. And the whole world is going to be amazed at the miracle. Aaron called me up the, yesterday, I think it was. And, and we were talking about that. The whole world is going to be amazed because even the false prophet and the beast are going to call fire down from heaven. I mean, who, who calls fire down from heaven? Elijah, that's the only one I know of. And people are going to be like, oh my gosh, this is God. He's the Christ. He's come back again to Christians. They can keep on waiting. 
wait. He's here. And listen to me. There's going to be many a Christian that are going to get caught up in this garbage. And some people want to know why. Why you got to call stuff out? Because I'm telling you, there's something called the ecumenical movement. What is ecumenism? It's the idea that it's all going to be one. No, my friend, you can't all be one. When you got people like Rick Warren and the Pope, and you got people like Kenneth Copeland, and they're all working together, and they're talking about the institution of a one world religion, and they're all saying that we're going to all be one, and Rick Warren has said it is documented. I'm not telling you something that I think it might have happened. I read it with my own eyes. He said we have to work together. We will form Krizlam. We will sign agreements. And we will work arm to arm. See, it's not that I can't work with a Muslim person. I got close friends that are Muslim people that I buy olive oil from. That have blessed me with trinkets and gifts from Petra. I told them about Jesus. I took my chances. I didn't know what was going to happen. But I felt like I needed to share. They still haven't bought into what I've told them. I've prayed with them before. Okay, so I ain't nothing. That I got against it, against being friendly with those people. But I told the one lady, I said, You do know that one of us is wrong, right? I mean, we're not both right. She said, Yes. I said, Okay. And, and I'm not going to tell you what, what else I told her. Well, I, I did. I read one time about the Prophet Muhammad wrote this commentary called the Hadith. It's a commentary on the Quran. And the one thing that I remember when I was studying world religions was this one thing. I said, that's it right there. Bam! That's my argument point against the Muslims. Right here, that's one argument point. I've learned other ones since I've been going prison ministry and stuff like that. But this is the point. Muhammad said in the Hadith, with one drop of the martyr's blood, all sin is atoned." <laughs> so I quoted that to him. I said, listen, Muhammad, you heard of the Hadith, right? Oh, yeah. Muhammad wrote the Hadith, right? Yeah. In, one, in the Hadith, this is what Muhammad said. With one drop of the martyr's blood, all sin is atoned. I said, the problem with that is, man, your blood is tainted. My blood is tainted. The martyr's blood is tainted. It has sin. Sinful blood cannot pay the atonement for anything. Okay, Jesus was the sinless one. That's why his blood matters, all right? Anyway, so I, I don't know how I got off on that. Lord, okay. look. We need to dig the Huh? Yeah, yeah. No. Praise God. Praise God. All right, I don't even know where I was. We were talking about the Valley of Harmony again. Frogs. Huh? Frogs. <laughs> Frogs. Demon spirits. Bringing all these nations. Deception, right? This great deception. World leaders being deceived. Nations being deceived. Individuals being deceived. Here we, we've made our way back. Christians yeah. being deceived. That's right. Because they're being herded. And told that certain things are the right way to go and that we can lock arms. No, we can't lock arms because this is the this is where I got thrown off. This is what he said. See, at the first part, when you're reading it, you can be like, well, yeah, I can work side by side with a Muslim. Yeah, if I'm building a house. But what he said was so that we can bring forth world peace. That's a problem, buddy. We just lost it right there. Because see, the world peace. That the world is trying to bring about is the same world peace that was under the, the leadership of the spirit that was at Babel, which is the same spirit that's behind the spirit of Antichrist, which is the spirit of Jezebel, which is harlotry, which is a lie, which is deception, which is world deception. No, my friend, we ain't bringing no world peace. Ain't no preacher bringing no world peace. There ain't going to be no peace on this world till the Prince of Peace shows back up and he's coming after the man. Of sin shows up. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. You need to know that we need to know our Bible. And we need to be prepared. And, you know, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day, and it was so true that we got to be careful that we don't start judging down towards other believers and, and, and condemning other believers because, listen, a lot of times people just don't know. Right? right? And so we have to. Be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. We have to know the scriptures, but at the same time, the motives of our heart have to be right. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And when the motives of your heart are right, what you desire is for someone to be free. Yes. And then, because you don't want to see them under the spell, look if I can call it that, of bondage, under the spell of lies, confused and deceived from yeah. the truth. Because, see, Jesus said you will know the, the truth. The definite article is in the Greek right there, by the way, and it matters. 
means it's a noun, it's a specific truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Praise God. God's given us the truth. And listen, if people are staying away from that truth, there's churches filled with people that are never experiencing new levels of freedom. Because they're sitting under things that are not true. Amen? Alright. So here's the seventh trumpet. Well, no, I wanted to bring you back over there. Let's see here. Because I wanted to talk to you about, so this, I want to bring you back to the frogs. Okay. For they are the spirits of devils. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Well, that's good stuff right there. But I wanted to bring you... Talking about being naked. Keep your garment, my friend. You don't want to walk around naked, amen? You don't want your shame to be exposed. Listen, when you see something like that, like, you know what the fear of read, just reading your Bible? You should read your Bible. Please, read as much of your Bible as you can. Read it over and over and over again. But one of the things that happens sometimes, there's a difference between reading and studying. So there's a time for both. I just want you to know. I mean, I read sometimes, I listen. But it's when you start to study, you start to catch on to, to commonalities that occur in the Word of God. This garment thing, this is throughout the Word of God. This whole garment thing and being ashamed, this will bring you all the way back to Genesis. This will bring you all the way back to the garden. Whenever Adam and Eve found themselves naked before the Lord, and God said, how did you know you were naked? Why are you trying to sow fig leaves upon yourself? Okay. Uh, but anyway, and, that, and so you don't want to walk around naked. And you'd see, but you as a believer... You don't have to walk around there. You're clothed in Christ. That's what Galatians 3.27 says. Those of you that have been baptized in Christ, it's not talking about water baptism. We need to get your water baptized. We're well, talking about the day that you believed in Christ, that you were baptized into him by the Holy Spirit. You became one with him. Water baptism. Listen, this is a good time to teach a little bit about water baptism. We should be going to have one coming up. Water baptism is an outward sign of what has already taken place in you. See, whether you realize it or not, you were like Adam and Eve, naked in the garden before you got saved. You didn't have no cover, no spiritual covering to speak of. But then somebody told you the good news of the gospel and you said, yes, by faith, you you believed it in your heart. You confessed it with your mouth. And when you did, the Holy Spirit came to live in your heart. But at the same time the Holy Spirit came to live in your heart, you got covered and clothed in the righteousness of Christ. See, and when you go down into the water of water baptism, it's like the old man that was born of Adam. Listen, the first birth, what happened in the first birth? What were you living in before you were born the first time? Your mama's water, right? You was an amniotic fluid sitting inside your mama's tummy. And whenever you gushed forth in your first birth, what did you gush forth in? Water, when the water broke, right? So listen, there's a connection between water and the first birth. And Jesus gushed out water. That's right, that's good. The blood and the water gushed out. Yeah. Oh man, there's so much there. Look, we ain't even talking about the rib. His side, God created Eve out of this. Jesus. Oh man, it is so good. Listen, we got we got to stay focused. But look, whenever that old man he dies and he's buried in the water, and he comes up a new man. Amen. Symbolically speaking, when you get now, there is I believe that there's a there's a you know Adam, there's a guy that Aaron and I used to know over at Crossing Place. Yeah, Crossing Place, named Adam Nash, and he used to use this. Kind, I didn't agree with everything he said, but he was a smart dude. He knew a lot about. And he would talk about channels of grace. And he would talk about communion a lot. And how communion, through communion, like, dude, I'm telling you, when you take communion by yourself at home, or even really where we want to try to get it to where it's right here, that's why we're kind of, not, I don't want to say the wrong word, I'm not playing with communion. But sometimes, like, maybe, like, if I give you the communion elements first, and then you get along with the Lord while the music's playing right, 
and you take the communion when you feel led and it's between you and the Lord, but at the same time we're doing it corporately, I'm telling you, there is such power when we take communion and we're really focused on the Lord. And so that's what Adam says. It's like a channel of grace, but there's a channel of grace that flows through water baptism. And part of it is because God, Jesus said, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's what's important for us to be water baptized. Amen. Listen, they don't tell them what can happen. Every time, every time I baptize somebody in water, I'm just trying to say, like, you never know. Something, I mean, it may, nothing, nothing may happen. It just might come up with a, with a big smile and water flying all over the place. But you never know. I mean, listen, the Brownsville Revival, you can do what you want with all that. Some people thought it was good. Some people think it was good. I, I went twice. And I saw good and bad. But let me just tell you this. The most powerful thing, fighting night <coughs> baptism. So, oh, my God. I'm talking about 20, 30 people every Friday night getting baptized in the water. I'll never forget this one. I get all choked up every time I think about it. She was an Oriental girl, and she was in that she was in that baptistry. And she said, I don't want the Buddha. I want my Jesus. And boy, they dumped her in that water, and she came back out. I'm just saying, like, that's salvation, my friend. The water baptism is the act that symbolizes and shows us what has happened in the spiritual realm when you got saved and you were baptized, spiritually speaking, without being able to see with the eyes, baptized into Christ, and you became a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. God. She said, I don't want food. I don't want my Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Listen, so these unclean spirits, we're talking about deception right now. I wanted to show you this. Because, see, these unclean spirits are bringing mankind to this battle. God's allowing it to all be arranged. But I wanted to show you something in the Old Testament, 1 Kings 22, 21. This is another thing that we would learn, that we would see if, if we study that book together, because the guy uses this specific instance to make a point. But I'm not gonna make try to make that point. But look, there came forth the spirit. So this is if you know the story here. There, you remember King Ahab? King Ahab was in the Old Testament. He's Israel. He's married to Jezebel. And he's let Jezebel influence the kingdom. And she's got all these false prophets. And they're eating at the table with her. And they're all worshiping and whining and dining. And she's hanging out with a bunch of prophets of Baal. Like a completely different God. Who's ever heard of such a thing happening in the nation of Israel, right? And there's a lot more that we can talk about with that. Because her dad was a king of a false of a nation that worshiped false gods. So why did you marry her to begin with? You weren't supposed to do that. But anyway, God says, he, Jehoshaphat is, an, is the king of Judah. Israel's up here. And King Ahab, Syria has taken a place called Ramoth Gilead. And that doesn't belong to Syria. So Ahab contacts Jehoshaphat and says, hey, won't you make an alliance with me? Because at the time the kingdom split. All right, if you didn't know that, that there was a time after Solomon that the kingdom split. And so Ahab says, won't you come fight with me? And so Jehoshaphat says, yeah, you're right, man. Ramoth Gilead doesn't belong to Syria. That belongs to the, to the people of God. So he goes up there and he says, but hey, is there a prophet? Can we can we call on the prophet? So Because, you know, we want to get to the heart of the Lord on this. You don't, you're not supposed to be making decisions in your life if you're a servant of the Lord without inquiring of the Lord. Amen? And in those days... They asked the prophet, hey, we need some wisdom. Well, Ahab starts trucking these false prophets out there. Jehoshaphat is like, oh my gosh, is there not another prophet that, that, we can, that we can call on? And Ahab has the audacity to say, yeah, there's this one. His name's Micaiah. I got him in prison right now. Because look, he don't ever tell me what I want to hear. So they go, he says, can we just hear what he's got to say? And so they go get Micaiah. And Micaiah comes out there and, you know, he, he knows what's up. He's like, man, this is like a game, dude. They keep pulling me out here. He knows I ain't going to change my story. Let me go ahead and just tell him what he wants to hear. It's what he wants. Go forth and conquer, for the Lord will give you victory. That's how I'm seeing him say this. Because Ahab says, you're not telling me the truth. Tell me the truth. And so, so Micaiah says, you want to know the truth? Here's the truth. There came forth the Spirit. This is what Micaiah saw in the Spirit. And there came forth the Spirit and stood before the Lord. 
and said, I will persuade him. See, God said, who will persuade Ahab? We're given a glimpse into the spiritual realm in this chapter. And what God is allowing you and I to see with this word is that there's some counsel going on in the heavenly realm. And God's saying, who will go down there and persuade Ahab to do something that I don't want him to do? Because I don't want to, I, I mean, that I want him to do, but he thinks he's going to win. But in reality, I'm going to chastise him. So who's going to persuade him? And Micaiah is saying, I'm going to tell you. See all these false prophets that have been lying to you? They're telling you to go forth? Well, let me tell you what's really going on here in the spiritual realm. And he says, came forth the spirit. And he stood before the Lord. And he said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. I'm trying to make a point to you. That there's people that want to be lied to. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Does that sound harsh? Yeah, it kind of does. But it's the truth. There are people that want to be lied to. They don't want to hear the truth. Because they want to do what it is that they want to do. And so God says, he says, I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, you shall persuade him. God said, yep, yeah, that's going to work. And prevail. Also, go forth and do so. Therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all your prophets. And the Lord has spoken evil concerning you. It's not like God got this idea from this lying spirit. God didn't need the lying spirit to tell him. God is allowing somehow in the heavenly realm things to take place. And he's allowing spiritual entities however you want to look at it, to work with him, to work he, manip he not manipulates, he's like a, a chess master on a board. J but listen, that shouldn't sound that crazy because what does he do with you? Right. What, what does he do with you? Does he not allow you to partake in the battles of life? Does he not allow you and I to partake in this war that's taking place towards this harvest of souls? No, he does. Alright, but anyway. I want you to see this. Though, see, some people want to hear a lie. So I, I shared this with y'all the other day. This is out of Jeremiah. I mean, because listen, I want you to know something. This same spirit is alive today. This same spirit is the same spirit that's within these three frogs that's telling these nations and these kings to go across the Euphrates and go to the valley, of, to go to Jezreel, to Megiddo for the battle of Armageddon, thinking that they're going to win something. And God's like, yep, let them lying spirits bring you over here. Because that's, what, that's what's about to happen. It's about to go down. As soon as y'all show up, the Lord's coming back on a white horse with the sword of the word in his mouth. And he's going to destroy the nations. All right, so the prophet, listen, this is Jeremiah. I just switched on you. Jeremiah 5, 31. I want you to see this. Now, this, this is what I want you to see. These are God's people. Now, you may not be able to take a jump from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But you see, it's easy for me to see the connection between the two. See, the guys that are setting up this camera stuff once it's all done, they said, you know, they made a comment. They said, it not me. Transgender's been around. The Roman Empire was full of transgender. Yeah, of course. Because the same spirit. The spirit of Antichrist. Caused it then, caused it now. Okay, it's not difficult to see. The same spirit that was lying in the Old Testament is the same spirit that lies today. The same spirit that lies to the world also lies to the people of God. You understand? We shouldn't be that confused to know that there's people being lied to. Is everybody being lied to? No. But we got to know the Word of God and we got to have the discernment of the Holy Spirit to be able to tell what's a lie and what's the truth. Amen? Well, this is what the prophet, this is what Jeremiah, God said to Jeremiah. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their own means. In other words, the priests, they're just help under, working under their own authority. And look at this. This is the part I want you to see. And my people love to have this so. So, what I need you to know is, is that sometimes even God, people that I believe love God, people that, that say that they love the Lord, are sometimes wanting to hear a lie because they have tickling ears. They have itchy ears. They want to hear pleasant words. And so they flock themselves to people that are going to tell them the things that they want to hear. That, this is the word of God. I didn't, look, I didn't even get into the New Testament to tell you all the lies and deception. Look, this brings you back to 2 Thessalonians 
too. We've already studied it. Look, this is why God's going to allow this wrath to be poured out. This is why God's going to allow all this deception to happen. Look, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe in God. That's, Christian, that's some sobering stuff. Right? Amen. God is going to send a lie through the Antichrist, through the false prophets, false miracles. He's going to allow a delusion to take place. That's why I believe it says in the book of Matthew that if this time frame were not shortened, that even the elect would be deceived. It is going to be so deceptive. Why would God allow such a thing? He just told you. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong belief that they should believe. Basically, you know what God does? He gives people. He allows people through the free will to have. And sometimes people don't even realize they're wanting to lie because they didn't like the truth. That's how it started. When they heard the truth, they didn't like it. And they preferred a lot. Alright. So, anyway. Uh, let's go back to Revelation. Where were we? 16. Getting towards the end there. He gathered them together at a place called Hebrew Tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. There came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great that the great city was divided. That's the part I wanted you to see. I'm about to go back to my little screen. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine. Of the fierceness of his wrath. Listen, whenever we get into next week, when we get into next week, man, it's so strange. My um, just my thing doesn't look anything like that. My thing's not green, but anyway, it's strange. All right, when we get into next week, when we start talking about Babylon, we're going to talk about Babylon, the harlot of Babylon. We're going to talk about the city of Babylon. I want you to know that that God that God is bringing judgment on that. Amen. And it says the temple of God was open. There was this is this is uh, trumpet seven. The temple was seen in this temple. The ark of His testament. There were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. I wanted you. And there were, look, here it is again, I'm, I'm, we're comparing. Trumpet 7, vile 7. There were voices and thunders and lightnings and great, there was a great earthquake, such as was not seen since men were upon the earth. Earthquake. And look, Babylon split in three. It also talked about a hundred pound hail. <coughs> when we get to Babylon, who is prophetic Babylon? We're going to start getting into that next week. I'm closing right this is the seven-headed beast with this harlot. Now, what I want you to know is whenever God's talking about the city of Babylon, I want you to, some people have thought that it has to be a literal city. But what I need you to, I need you to try, I've already tried to really explain this to y'all before, and we'll get into it next time more deeply. We may even have to spend a couple of sessions on Revelation 17. That... Mystery Babylon is not just, it's not just a, it doesn't have to be a literal city. It's a, it's a spiritual city. It's a place where evil has been living and a place for, for, for all the time. It, it's, it's a mixture of financial Babylon. It's a mixture of religious harlotry. It's a mixture of all the evil that has been hiding on the earth for all these thousands of years. And you remember way back when we were studying Daniel? Y'all remember that? Y'all probably don't remember that because I mean, what was that last year or something? 
We were studying Daniel when we first started the end time events and all of the different nations that were coming, that the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And God was explaining that these are going to, this, this is something that's leading up to the end. The, the nations of, of Persia and Greece and Rome and how they're all interconnected against God. They've been against God. They've been against God's people. And all of these governments have been a system, along with false religion, that have pulled mankind away from God. And so, uh, and that's a place, if you can see it, that's a place of people are living in this city of Babylon, if you will, living in the law. Here's just another depiction. But look, last thing, you know, see right here, the Bible says that before it's over with, the beast. The beast is going to destroy the heart. Mm -hmm. Because you know what the beast is the Antichrist? The beast is the false, Satan's false version of Jesus. And just like God allowed worship to come to him through the person of Jesus, the dragon wants worship to come to him through the person of the Antichrist. And there's going to come a day when he's going to say all these false religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, what he's going to say, Christianity, all of that has to be destroyed because he is going to demand to be worshipped in the temple as God. That's what the Bible says. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We're asking you to have your way in our hearts and in our lives, Lord. I pray that you give us all wisdom, eyes to see, ears to hear, that you give us understanding, Lord, that you would allow the eyes of our understanding to be enlightened, that we would know the truth, Lord. And that we will be led by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. Jesus.